right, so thank you everyone. Um, as I said, my name is Marcella McGuire. I'm with Corporation for Supportive Housing. We're here to talk to you about the basic structure of the Medicaid program. For those of you who are offering services under the 1915 I state plan amendment for behavioral health in North Dakota, for those of you that want to do this, you are joining a new program. You are joining a new program called Medicaid um, and or medical assistance. And we want you to understand some basic foundations. We're not gonna talk in detail about the 1915 I state plan amendment and the services there. A lot of that is going to come in the Medicaid Academy, which I believe is starting on August 3rd. Um, you should have received uh, provider readiness assessments from Eva Lerner or Ambrosia Crump from our team. Take a look at that. They're asking you questions. If you've got any questions about those assessments, please bring them to today's Q&A as well. We've got the next two hours here basically to go through some really fundamentals of the program, but then also to answer questions about all of that. And I'm grateful that we've got Monica and any of the other folks from the state here because every state program is different. Um, and there are a lot of questions maybe that haven't been answered yet or haven't been asked yet. Um, um, and we really need the state's vision and guidance here because they're they're the authority here. So welcome everybody. We're here to talk to you about Medicaid 101, the basic structure there. So next slide, please. So your training team, I'm gonna ask people to uh, come off of mute and introduce themselves. Um, I lead CSH's uh, health system integration work nationwide. I'm based out of Philadelphia. I'm a clinical psychologist by training and I have done work with systems um, in many communities across the country, but particularly in depth in Philadelphia, in DC and in Atlanta where I went to graduate school. I've had the privilege of working with good people in North Dakota for the last five years with your Medicaid office, with your with Jake Reuter and your money policy the person team, et cetera. Um, and uh, we did a Medicaid Academy that was focused on housing support services only for housing providers in 2021. We're really excited to be able to expand this work to a broader network of folks in 2022. So happy to be here and happy to meet you all. Um, for folks, we've got like about 120, 147 people I see now. So if folks want to put it in the chat and put their name and what agency they're from and where in the state they're from, we'd love to see that as well. Um, and so, yeah, and Monica is saying, if you're not aware of the Medicaid Academy, we'll talk about that some today and want more info, reach out to Monica. Um, I think I will ha I hand it over to Ambrosia for her to introduce herself as well. Hey, I think it's good afternoon for you guys, maybe. Um, nope, still good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Ambrosia Crump. I'm a senior program manager with um, CSH, um, LCSW by trade. I have some direct practice experience, homeless service experience. Definitely have been a, am a provider, so know some of your pain points as well. Happy to explore you, um, maybe learning more about Medicaid if you aren't already involved in that world. So glad to provide support in this training. Great. And I will have Eva, my colleague, introduce herself next. It looks like. Hi, everybody. My name is Eva Lerner. I'm also a senior program manager with Corporation Supportive Housing. Pleased to work with Marcella and Ambrosia on this exciting work and to partner with Monica and the rest of you on this Medicaid Academy. I come to CSH from a background primarily in healthcare, focusing on social determinants of health. So have a variety of experience working with Medicaid, but have also been in the provider seat. So understand some of those pain points um, and am very happy to be here and look forward to, to moving forward in this training process with all of you. Thanks everybody. Um, and I see we've got at least one Barbie Hoffreth who's got some technical issues. Thank you for all the hellos and getting to meet everybody. This is exciting. Um, but I also wanna make sure if you've got technical issues, please put it in the chat and we'll try to help you resolve those technical issues as well. All right, so welcome. Let's get into today's training. So next slide, please. Oh, no audio. Definitely got people with audio issues. So, um, so we're gonna try to work on that. Um, first off, we want to see where in the state are you located? So grab the pencil icon at the top left. If you should see you're looking for an arrow, you're trying to grab that arrow and put it where it is that you're located in your state. Um, so please grab that. Let's see. I, I am not the technology expert here. So if anybody's, let's see. Do we see the, try 
trying to find the I don't see the pencil icon. I don't see the pencil icon either, Lisa, and I'm trying to figure that out myself. How did we lose that? Oh. Anybody know any of the Zoom experts here of which I'm a Medicaid expert. I am so not a Zoom expert. Go to the view options. Thank you, Michelle. View options at the top, annotate. Ah, there we go. View options at the top, annotate, and then you should get the pencil icon. Or an arrow, I see an arrow. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna put my arrow, see if I can learn how to do this. I'm gonna put my arrow east, because I am definitely east of you folks. We've got a couple people who figured it out. because I see a couple of arrows here. Well, we've got all of this in there as well, so. We've got people from Fargo, people from Rolla. All right. Click on the arrow. It's not working for me either. Bismarck. All right. We've got people from all across the state. It sounds like we've got some real concentrations in the Bismarck and the Fargo areas. I think that's probably not here of us, but let's let's check this out. And we've got a couple of people who figured it out. So congratulations. Um, yeah. All right, so next slide, please. So hopefully we got a good sense that we've got people from all across the state. Jamestown, thank you. Thank you. And next slide, please. All right, so the final, no, oh, there we go. So the final word on all things North Dakota Medicaid is your North Dakota Department of Human Services. We've got a link here. Yes, people will not just get the recordings, they will also get the slides. There's a lot of necessary links in the slides, et cetera. This is the state website. A lot of what we're doing for you here is we're familiar with Medicaid programs across the country. We're working collaboratively with Monica and Dawn Pearson and the other folks from DHS. The final word is all of is DHS and for human services. So we're going to try to help you, and this is particularly a part of the Medicaid work, we're going to try to help you say DHS has set this policy. How do I implement said policy in a quality and compliant way in my agency? But at the end of the day, the policy is really set for um, is set by the folks at Department of Human Services. So yeah, right. any questions there? So next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about the history of Medicaid. We're gonna talk about the basics, the fundamentals. We're gonna talk about the current landscape, particularly in North Dakota, because that's what's relevant to you as well. And we're gonna talk about Medicaid reimbursement opportunities as well. How to think about this program from an agency perspective. My guess is that many, many of your agencies, you're focused on grants. You get a grant, you, excuse me, you apply for a grant, you get the grant, you do the work, you write the report to the funder saying, here's how we did the work. Medicaid operates very differently. Medicaid operates in what's called a retrospective payment model. That means that you sign up to be a Medicaid provider. You, your agency signs up for people to be a Medicaid provider. People sign up and get signed up for Medicaid and they as individuals, and then you deliver the services and then you get paid. This creates kind of a cash flow challenges for agencies and we're grateful for the state who's done some early grants on this, um, but important work here. So we're gonna talk about some of the Medicaid reimbursement opportunities and think about the programs and the structures. There's a lot of new language here. There's a lot of words. I will tell you as somebody who's done this work over decades, I am always 
learning something new. You cannot expect that you're going to get it all right away. You can expect that you're going to get a little bit right away and you're going to get a little more tomorrow and a little more the day after that. So please be patient with yourself, be kind, be thoughtful um, and build your network in this space because there are lots of people who get lots of different pieces of this. This is not, somebody said this on my last call, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, prepare yourself and, and prepare yourself for that marathon. So next slide, please. So want to ask a poll, um, you know, since we had such trouble with the pieces here, I want to make sure that um, folks put in this chat, are you tracking for the people that you serve? Are you tracking who's eligible for insurance? Who is Medicaid enrolled? Meaning the state of North Dakota recognizes them as a Medicaid recipient. Who's insured? Who's not? And are you tracking if the person has traditional Medicaid or they are Medicaid expansion? That's going to be really important because people who have traditional Medicaid, you're billing the state directly. And we'll talk about that process. And if people have Medicaid expansion, then as of January 1st, you're billing Blue Cross Blue Shield. So if you are going to start to work with the Medicaid program, you're going to have to start tracking who among the people you serve are enrolled. Are they insured or not? Are they insured by Medicaid? Are they insured by Medicare? And are they traditional Medicaid or ex Medicaid expansion? So let's, I see a lot of people say, saying yes, a couple of people saying not currently, and then who's insured or not, and then who are they insured by? Are you working with veterans who are covered by the veterans health care? Are you working with older individuals who may have Medicare? This is something that if you're going to get into the Medicaid space, you're going to have to start tracking. Um, in the Medicaid Academy, session two focuses on this and we'll have tools on here as well. But keep putting in there. So Becky knows who's insured traditional and expansion. Again, a couple people not people currently. Um, if you don't know the answer to this question, that's also a good thing to start thinking about within your agency. So yep, you're serving justice and populations. This is not tracked for them at that time. Lisa, you bring up a really good point about justice involved populations. When an individual is incarcerated, they are no longer eligible. When an individual is released to the community, they are therefore eligible, but they may or may not be enrolled. And there's particular work that has to work to get them enrolled. Um, Yes, Paulette's not tracking, you're waiting to be an approved provider. You don't have to wait to be an approved provider before you can track. That's a choice you're making. You can still track, you can still ask people, have you been to the human services zones? Are you Medicaid enrolled, et cetera? You know what, let me take just two seconds as part of the training to get some of our tools on this. I will see. Um, I'll, I'll put the eligibility tracker up here. If you're part of the Medicaid Academy, you will get it there. But if somebody wants to run with it now, that's awesome. So we'll give you the eligibility tracker now. Just a second. You know what, I'm gonna put the eligibility tracker though. I saw Katie Jo Armbrust who was leading our work with Grand Forks Housing Authority. If Katie Jo, if you wanna share the, uh, just the whole TA drive, et cetera, that we have um, and share that link there. I think that would be really helpful. Uh, folks can begin to take a look at that. And then I'm just gonna share the eligibility tracker, which is one file. Katie Jo, if you don't mind sharing, you know, all the, you know, the files and files here. All of this is open. Everything here is, is available for download. So feel free. Thank you. I 
and that's all been, um, and all of the materials though have also been tailored for the North Dakota context. So, so you won't have to make some major changes there. Okay, next slide, please. My screen is flashing. Why is my screen flashing? Eek, I hope my screen stops flashing. I haven't had anybody else. Next slide, please. Okay, so why is North Dakota encouraging Medicaid for these behavioral health services? The state recognizes the level of need in our communities. The state recognizes we don't have as many of the services that are needed to address the needs for the people we're trying to serve. The potential for scale is with Medicaid. Medicaid is what's called an entitlement program. And what that means is that if you can prove that you qualify for the services and need the services, then the state is required to deliver those services to you. The state has networks of providers like yourselves that are all part of this, but Medicaid is really the only program that gives us a potential for scale. States also really like Medicaid because of what's called federal financial participation. For most Medicaid programs, there's a lot of nuances here, but at the end of the day, if the state pays for a program, the state puts a dollar into the program, the program has a dollar. If the state puts a dollar into a Medicaid program, the state has $2 because the federal government puts in a dollar as well. So a, Medicaid is called a state and federal partnership because half of the funding comes from the feds, half of the funding comes from the states, generally speaking. There are exceptions, there are exceptions to everything in Medicaid, so get used to that, but there's a fiscal, federal fiscal financial participation that really makes this good fiscal sense for states. Um, we are seeing increasing needs of service participants in our communities. We are seeing people who are finding challenges to, to connect to regular services. We're seeing more severe needs. We're seeing more illness. We're seeing more complicated illnesses, et cetera. Um, and we really want to make sure that those services can actually get to those people and get to those participants. All of that, those high level clinical skills are things that are really much more easily facilitated within Medicaid. States are shifting away from institutional care, nursing homes, big state hospitals to home and community-based care. All the surveys of individuals with disabilities, people who need services say, would you rather get your services as an institution? Would you rather be in the community? Would you rather be with your family? Would you rather have your own place and your own independent living or be in these group home settings, et cetera? People generally speaking, they all wanna be in a more independent community-based settings. So it follows the messages that we're hearing from people with lived experience. And then finally, the state is shifting away from funding general fund dollars to braided funding models incorporating with federal dollars. Much of this braiding of funding happens at the state level. You just see the money comes from the state. Know that the federal dollar is already braided in there. Know how important Medicaid is to that process. I will also say this clearly from the start, Medicaid has a greater administrative burden than many um, I was gonna say, then, and many other programs, certainly it's more administratively burdensome than grant programs. It's the only thing that gives us potential for scale. And it's also often kind of a steep initial climb, a challenging climb, but once you get it and you have your systems in place and we're gonna be helping you set up those systems, then you get it and it all flows freely. So there is a lot of potential. That first step is often the toughest, but I promise you, you will get there. So there's a question I just got in the chat from Chris, are justice involved individuals who are in the community participating in residential reentry program and are inmate status eligible? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think you would need to, unless Monica or Jennifer or any other of the state officials have an answer to that one, um, we, can, we can look that up and check, but I think that's a really important question. Um, because you say inmate status, if generally speaking, if they're living in the community, they're Medicaid eligible, but you have to do the work to get them enrolled. But inmate status makes me question that. Monica, do we know? You know, as long as they're not residing in the institutional setting, which would be the correctional facility, and they're in the community, that they would meet the home and community-based settings rule. So they would be eligible for 1915I. Um, and Daniel asked another question is the distinction between parolee and a probationer. Um, parolee or probationer doesn't matter. What matters is what Monica said. Are they living in the community in a, com in a, in a community based setting? So are they, um, are they living in an environment that they or their family, et cetera, are paying for? 
um, or they could be on a housing subsidy, they could be in a they could be in a program, et cetera. They can't be living in a place where the state is responsibility for what has responsibility for what's called room and board. Court ordered inpatient treatment doesn't matter. Again, it's where are they living? And does the state have responsibility for room and board? Inpatient treatment, generally speaking, they are Medicaid enrolled. Generally speaking, the inpatient treatment provider has done the work to get them Medicaid enrolled because otherwise the inpatient treatment provider is not going to get paid. Um, but that's something that you want to check. Once you become a provider, you're going to have access to that system where you can do that checking. Um, but um, even before that, the individual can do the checking for themselves. You can support that so you can begin to track that. Um, so Lisa's saying there's variation in how the zones, counties have interpreted eligibility for people living in settings that are alternative to incarcerations. This is an area of growth in North Dakota for sure. Yep, absolutely. Um, I wonder, uh, again, Monica, I'm sorry to keep picking on you, but um, or if there's anybody else from the state, I'm really looking for a state um, it might be helpful for the state to offer guidance on this clarity question, just because there's so much engagement on this right away. Yes, absolutely, Lisa. That's a great point. Um, there is a lot of variation in how the zones determine that. Um, it's a very gray area because the home and community-based settings rule is very, very complicated. Um, you know, we tend to look at each individual case by case. We do have, um, you know, an assessment of the of the setting that they'll be living in that, that is kind of an initial assessment. And then we have, you know, an enhanced scrutiny assessments as well to determine if they do meet that home and community-based settings rule. Um, the best we can do for right now, um, you know, we're working on some more permanent solutions is just to kind of look at each case one by one and make that determination um, whether or not they meet that, that criteria. I but also want, oh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, we ideally what we want is a list, like an, an um, all-encompassing list of different um, different settings and a yes or no, but we're certainly not there yet. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to make a, a point. Monica's talking about the home and community-based settings rule. This is about the 1915 I services. I'm talking particular about general Medicaid enrollment. Are they eligible for Medicaid? When I'm living in a jail, when I'm living in a state prison, when I'm living in a state hospital, I am not eligible for Medicaid enrollment. When I am living in any kind of community setting, I have my own apartment, I'm living with my family, I'm living in a group home, I'm living in any other setting. Generally speaking, you should be Medicaid eligible and therefore being enrolled, though obviously the zones, we're gonna talk about this a little bit, the human services zones have been the people who do the Medicaid enrollment. If they interpret it as, oh, you're living in a group home setting, group home settings aren't eligible, that's gonna be a problem. They're the people you've got to get through. So yeah, Monica tends to live in the 1915 I world. I'm about to too, Monica, I've got to remind myself this, you know, for this one, we are talking just about Medicaid in general. If you are working with people who are low income, you want them to be Medicaid enrolled. You want them to make sure because otherwise any service they get, if they go to a hospital, if they go to a primary care doctor, if they go to an ER, if they're not Medicaid enrolled, somebody is going to be coming after that person for that payment. You want to make sure they are Medicaid enrolled. Enrolled for 1915I services is a separate, really important question. But if you are not Medicaid enrolled, you are eligible for very, very little. So we're just going to focus here just for this session on Medicaid enrollment in particular. Um, and as I said, in session two of the Medicaid Academy, we'll get to 1915I enrollment. So next slide, please. So why should your agency build Medicaid? Why should you go through all of the administrative burdens and challenges are here? Why is everybody here for this conversation? Well, one, there's greater needs in our community. There's greater behavioral health needs. There's greater homelessness needs. There's greater child-related needs. There's greater family needs. And the state, as they look to expand services and address those needs, is going to look to Medicaid before they look to anything else. Because again, Medicaid brings down that federal dollar. The state can put a dollar in to do any kind of the social services good work that needs to be done. But if they bring down a Medicaid dollar, they match it with a federal dollar and now they put two dollars in instead of one. So that's where the state's going to be looking at to address community needs. It's much more fiscally sustainable for your services models. 
basically would talk about this in terms of, you know, no one goes into social services or this kind of work in order to, in order to get rich, but we all do need to pay our own bills, et cetera. So we need to be doing some business thinking about if you're leading an agency, you need to be thinking about, you know, the business models, the fiscal sustainability models to make sure that you can keep your doors open, that you can keep doing that work. Your participant service needs are growing. The people that you normally work with have more needs, complex needs. They're maybe not just aging, but they're also experiencing behavioral health issues. Maybe they're experiencing homelessness and housing instability. You've got families with complex needs in child welfare, a family member in incarceration, all of these different things coming together. You need to be interacting with all of these other systems in order to holistically address the needs of the family. Um, families come as a unit. Um, individuals come with integrated needs. They don't think about, oh, the federal money for healthcare comes here and the federal money for housing comes there and behavioral health. They just know they need help and they need people who can address those needs. So a lot of this is being integrated in towards Medicaid. Again, to the point I just made in the examples I just gave, when you're doing Medicaid, you can bring in more specialized and more intensive services to people with a higher level of need. Far too often agencies that often just do grants, they can they can reach sort of one level of need. They can't reach those higher level of needs. They don't have the funding. They don't have the staff. They don't have the complexity um, and those clinical qualifications of the staff, et cetera. So to address more specialized needs, you're going to need to think about billing Medicaid. So that's why we're teaching you some of these fundamentals about Medicaid. Um, so again, you're trying to address community needs. You're trying to make sure you're keeping the doors open, et cetera. Um, and you're trying to ingress a growing service participants and family related needs. Next slide, please. So let's talk about Medicaid, medical assistance. Medicaid is about to, end of the month, will celebrate its 57th birthday. Um, I was born about three weeks before Medicaid. That's how I can keep this track of this. Um, it was authorized under Section 9 of the Social Security Act of 1965. It started as health insurance for pregnant and parenting women and children. Um, it's a counterpart for Medicare. Medicare covers people who are 62 and older, um, any American. Um, she is getting Medicare. Uh, Medicaid is for people with extremely low income and it's evolved over the last 50 plus years. I will say that also there are individuals who are qualified for Medicare because they are older. They qualify for Medicaid because they are extremely low income or disabilities. These are people who are called dual eligibles. You may be serving some of those as well. And we'll talk about that program as part of the day. So at the end of the day, it is health insurance coverage. It is not any specific service. Um, it is the coverage for those services. So it is payment for services so that people can access the services. Each state has its own, I think I'll talk about this later, state Medicaid plan. It says these are the services that we are offering. Um, and these are the services. So state makes choices about what services are offered. Uh, North Dakota in the last two to three years has made a significant expansion in their behavioral health services through what we'll talk about as the 1915I services. Um, and the federal government also set some floors for in order to have a Medicaid program, you have to offer these services. So it's been around for 57 years. It's very different state by state and it's a constantly evolving, very complex model. Um, if somebody tells you they know everything about the Medicaid program, um, um, look at them a little excant. It's a really big, complicated program. Next slide, please. So as we said, it's a federal and state partnership. The federal government says, hey, these are the guardrails. These are the requirements. These are the minimums. The state says, okay, here's how we want to operationalize that. DHS, Department of Human Services in North Dakota is your state Medicaid office. There's significant flexibility there. Each state's required to have a state Medicaid plan that outlines how Medicaid works in that state, what services are covered, what services are covered for what populations, et cetera. Um, and CSH in 2016 did what's called a Medicaid crosswalk, examining that state plan from at least from a housing angle. Um, we're happy to share that as well. But 16 has been a while. So one, the 1915 I services are there. They came in in 19 or 20. I can't remember um, off the top of my head right now. Um, so, but it's a federal state partnership. Partly why this is important to you is you like in any program when you're getting funding, you want to know like, okay, who sets the rules? And the answer in Medicaid, as in many things with Medicaid is it's complicated. Uh, DHS sets many of the rules. Some of those rules DHS has to set in collaboration with the feds. Sometimes DHS wants to change something and they go have to go back and say, you know, think about with the 1915I, there was a disability score. It had to be a 50. Then they de 
increased it to 25. DHS couldn't do that on their own. They had to go back to the feds and say, hey, we're finding this out. So there was a constant dialogue. It's so important that Monica and Jennifer and other folks are here and that you've got that conversation and dialogue with the feds, I'm sorry, with your state folks to say, here's what's working, here's what's not. There's a constant ability to tweak the program depending upon how widespread um, the challenges you see are. So complicated federal state partnership, DHS is your local leader. Next slide, please. So who oversees Medicaid funding? Well, at the federal level, it's what's called the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services or CMS. Um, within your state, it's within DHS, your medical services division. Um, if a person is Medicaid eligible solely because of low income, they fall into what we call the expansion population, then Blue Cross Blue Shield is their managed care. If a person is eligible for Medicaid for any other reason, not just low income, but they're also disabled, they're also a pregnant or parenting woman, they're also um, uh, they're also elderly, then they would be as part of what in North Dakota is called the traditional Medicaid population. And, um, and they would be, uh, you would be billing uh, the state DHS, uh, the Medicaid manage, Management Information System or the MMIS system. Again, we'll go into this more in the Medicaid, but it's really important not just to track who's insured and how they're insured, but if they're insured in Medicaid, it's important to track what population they're insured under. If they are Medicaid expansion, you're sending your bills to Blue Cross and Blue Shield. If they are Medicaid, if they are any other group, you are sending your bills to the state. Uh, we'll talk about what's sending your bills. That's a big phrase to unpack here, but that's a very fundamental. You've got to know why people are um, eligible and what group they're in. So next slide, please. So this is what essential health benefits for the Affordable Care Act of 2010. These are the basics. This is the federal government says, if you don't cover these services, then you don't have a Medicaid program with us. We're not going to put in our dollar uh, if you don't have these essential health benefits. So inpatient hospital-based services, this is why you want everybody to have coverage. I want coverage. You want coverage for your families. Nobody wants to get these bills on their own. Emergency departments, hospitalization, maternity and newborn care all have to be covered. Outpatient services, ambulance, mental health and addiction treatment services, prescription drugs, basic rehabilitative services, lab, preventative pediatric, all essential health benefits. If that, so those are all covered in the state of North Dakota, they have a Medicaid program. The Fed says this is the floor, these are all covered. These essential health benefits are all covered per the Affordable Care Act. So next slide, please. So optional benefits, benefits that the state can choose to offer or not. Um, we've got a question in the chat. When is the COVID extension end or expire? What I'm guessing that you are asking is when is going to be the end of the public health emergency? Um, Medicaid, I will tell you one of my favorite things about Medicaid is that they have these magic phrases. You have to use the exact words um, in order to understand what you're really asking. So I'm gonna answer the question, um, Mr. or Mrs. Head Start, I, I don't see a name there, um, is asking, I think you're asking, and if you're asking a different question, help, help me out here. Um, the public health emergency, one of the requirements of the CARES Act of 2020. Hi, Tara, thank you. Um, so one of the requirements was, let me see, in January of 2020, because of COVID, the Secretary of Health and Human Services um, declared a public health emergency. We are still in that public health emergency. The CARES Act of 20 of March of 2020 said that as long as we are in a public health emergency, states cannot um, kick anyone off of their Medicaid program. They can get new people on who now qualify. I used to, you know, I wasn't pregnant before, but now I am, so now I qualify. I wasn't low income before, but now I am, so now I qualify. But everybody, it was all come in. It was nobody was getting kicked off of the program uh, because of the public health emergency. We should hear sometime in the next week or two if the Biden administration is choosing to extend the public health emergency beyond, let me see, it was July, three months. Um, we should hear in the next couple of weeks whether it's, I'm doing math in my head, which is a very slow process, forgive me, um, which is, um, when they will end it. The Biden administration has promised the states, the states will get, and everybody else will, everybody else will know it too if you read the paper, uh, will get 60 days notice. So sometime next week, 
I believe it's the 16th. 16th of the 17th, you should see some interesting headlines either that say the Biden administration has decided to end the public health emergency. The public health emergency will end mid-September. Or you will see headlines that says the Biden administration hasn't done anything. It hasn't said anything, which means in mid-September, they're committing to 90 days out, extend the public health emergency. The states when the public health emergency ends and they're already working on this has to do an enormous amount of work to re-qualify everybody in the Medicaid program. So if I'm on Medicaid because my income's low and I have a disability, if I'm on Medicaid because my income's low and I'm pregnant or parenting, if I, why ever I'm on Medicaid, they have to reconfirm that. This is an enormous amount of work for the states. It's an enormous amount of work for the zones. Um, and we will see that, and you also, and the state will be uh, sending information, often by snail mail, to the people you work with saying, in order to keep your Medicaid on, do these two to three things, show up to this office, keep this appointment, bring all your documents. We know that a lot of people can't manage that and master that, and so we've got to be helping them to make sure that they maintain what in the Medicaid space is called continuous coverage, meaning somebody's Medicaid coverage doesn't fall off because the state didn't get a piece of paper they need to verify that the person's low income or the person's still disabled or and the person's still old, any of those kinds of things. Um, you might say, hey, if I was 65 before, I've only aged since then, of course, I'm still going to be old. Um, but the states can put a lot of things in place to say, oh, but you have to prove to us that you're this again. Um, I don't know what they do, but I have seen states, not North Dakota, but I have seen states require you kind of come back with your birth certificate again and say, hey, look, I'm still old. Um, so know that that is a real challenge there and that's gonna be really important. So the end of the public health emergency and depending upon, we'll cover this in the Medicaid Academy as well, uh, because we will see what happens on July 16th. I'm guessing on that date, I've been away for a little while, so I'm not sure. That is the end of the public health emergency. So, um, one, you know, the takeaway here is work with the work with the folks you're working with. Make sure that they maintain continuous coverage. Make sure that they are either following up with what their mail requires them to follow up with to keep that continuous coverage, or support them in order to do that. It's going to be important to them for their own physical, you know, for their own health in general, their fiscal health as well. You don't want them getting big bills for services rendered that they're responsible for, et cetera. When it should be Medicaid. Um, it's also once you start billing for this, it's also going to be really important for you because if I'm not enrolled in Medicaid in the day you deliver a service from me and you're billing Medicaid for that service, you can't get paid. Let me say that again, because that's a big shift for people from the grant space world. If I'm met, not Medicaid enrolled on the day you deliver the service, the state or Blue Cross will not pay you for that service. The person who's receiving the services has to be enrolled in order for the agency who delivered the services to receive payment really, really important and a big shift for those of us who work just in the grant-based world. Okay, optional benefits. Oh, oh no, go back. Well, anyway, you guys were seeing that one for a long time. Thanks, Ambrosia. Um, optional benefits. These are benefits that the state can choose to offer or not. Again, CSH's Medicaid crossover will touch on a couple of them, but again, needs to be updated. Home and community-based services, you see as a listing, the 1915 I services are home and community-based services. They are optional benefits that the state of North Dakota has chosen to offer. Uh, certain drugs, nursing facilities, case management, targeted case management, rehab, transportation, dental, hearing, eyeglasses, all of these are optional benefits. Can you go back three months, Tara? So there is a process called retroactive eligibility. Remember, Medicaid is all about the magic phrases. If someone is determined to be eligible and the state determines that they were eligible in the past three months, that is retroactive eligibility. The state will move their eligibility date back three months and then you can bill. But you've got to be sure that the state has moved them back from that eligibility date. You need to know when the eligibility date is and you can get paid for as long as they are eligible or determined on that day. So yes, good question and complicated. Thanks, Tara, and thanks for giving me your name. Now we're up to the next slide. So I talked about populations. Let me talk about what some of the classic populations are for Medicaid and then give you some other ideas. Uncompensated care, really important. 
pregnant women and low-income children, generally speaking, covered. Elderly, blind, and disabled, generally speaking, covered. In North Dakota, these are called the traditional Medicaid populations. Individuals on Medicaid expansion, I'm poor, but I'm not, um, what was I going to say? I'm poor, but I'm not, don't have any of these other conditions, Dan, I'm in the Medicaid expansion population. Catherine's noting that the waiver eligible cannot go back three months. I think that has to do with the eligibility for the waiver, not the eligibility for the uh, Medicaid coverage. Um, but I think that's a, something we're gonna have, a distinction we're gonna have to get. Um, and, and Monica, I hope you can clarify that for us at some point, if, if, probably not now, but, but later because that's different from different states. I don't believe um, the waiver services can be covered three months back, but check on that. Um, other populations can be served. Individuals Medicaid expansion we talked about, youth in foster care, they may assume that everybody uses foster care is extremely low income. States may choose to put them all on Medicaid. Individuals who are duly enrolled in both Medicaid and Medicare, that's that duly enrolled group, et cetera. Um, and states may also put different rules in place about how often we have to be sure that those services, I'm sorry, that the person is eligible and enrolled, et cetera. Again, what's really important here is enrollment. I think that's my next slide, please. Okay, yeah, here we go, point made. Um, you have your traditional Medicaid expansion. I am low income and I have these other characteristics, pregnancy, family, older, disabled, I'm in the traditional Medicaid. I'm billing North Dakota Human Services for the services. Expansion, as of January 1st, I'm poor, but I don't have any of these other characteristics. I prove that low income to the state. Then I am in the Medicaid expansion group and I am uh, uh, billing Blue Cross Blue Shield North Dakota for the services. So that's partly why you have to know the differences here. Next slide, please. So streamlined enrollment, North Dakota requires you re-enroll every year. But again, thank you for that question about the public health emergency. Nobody has been re-enrolled or required to be re-enrolled since March of 2020. So that's going to come back. Most of this process is online and we'll share the link with that shortly. Um, states are increasingly linking up their government systems. If I go in and apply food stamps and it turns out I'm Medicaid eligible, they may ask about that as well. Gets more people on the services that they're entitled to, so that's important. Um, states are required to do a variety of enrollment protections. The Biden administration is really working hard to try to make sure that people's coverage doesn't lap because it laps. People don't get the healthcare services they need. They don't get the social services they need. And it's really bad for their long-term fiscal health. Any one of us, if we just suddenly got a, you know, a week's bill in the hospital could be wiped out financially for a very long time. So it's really important to help people maintain that continuous coverage. Um, and there's a lot of advocacy work that could also be done to try to make this um, limited in the administrative task. You wanna make this as easy as possible. You wanna reduce the burden so that people can access the services that they need and are entitled to. Um, but each one of those different burdens and steps of documentation, of multiple appointments, things like that, there's just some people who can't make that step, they fall out there. So. Um, we're helping states, we're helping a number of states right now look at how to make that process as easy as possible. So I'm going to pause for a minute and ask if there are any questions. You guys are doing great jumping into the chat. Any questions? I hope this is helpful. All right, next slide, please. So we are going to talk just a little bit about, because I know the long-term goal is to talk about the, the 1915I services. 1915I services, behavioral health, 1915I behavioral health services come under a program called long-term services and supports. Every state has an LTSS program. That LTSS program has two components to it. One is nursing facilities, and then two is the home and community-based services. 1915I services are home and community-based services. They're going to have to follow all of the rules and the regulations that come on with home and community-based services. There is a very clear rule within home and community-based services that HCBS services cannot pay for rent, cannot pay for housing. These are community services paying community providers to do that engagement in the community and help people stay in their homes, help people access homes, and then stay in their homes for as long as possible and not need that institutional level of care. North Dakota has also smartly made a real investment in their home and community-based services program, and that's a lot of the work that we're doing here because they 
they are, um, I believe they have an Olmstead agreement with the federal government of trying to move people out of institutional care. There is a Supreme Court decision, the Olmstead decision that says that people are entitled to live in a community-based setting that is as integrated as possible. Um, so there's a real push from the state perspective in order to do that. States also like that because if people are in state facilities and institutions, the state's paying the full freight. If the people are living in the community, the person's paying for their community living setting, and then they're just paying for the services. So fiscally, it makes sense for the states here. So long-term service supports of which HCBS is a provider. If you're a QSP, we've got a question in the chat. If you're a QSP provider providing nursing services, can you only bill to HCBS or would you be able to bill straight Medicaid if the client has Medicaid? So one, Lori, help me out. I don't know what QSP means. My guess is that's a North Dakota specific. Um, you are billing, again, it's depending is the person, expansion quality service provider. Okay, thank you. So if you are billing, if the person is uh, Medicaid expansion, you're billing Blue Cross. If the person is anything else, you're billing the state. I wonder if that's what you mean by straight Medicaid. Often billing the state for fee for service, that's often what people mean when they say straight Medicaid. So um, if you are delivering nursing, if you are a nursing home, that's one distinction. That's the LTSS nursing facility programs. If you are delivering community nursing services, then you are an HCBS provider and you're following the rules and you're billing, again, Blue Cross Blue Shield for the expansion population, HC, um, the state uh, Medicaid office for everything else. I hope that's answered your question. And if not, please uh, keep chatting in there. Clarify, clarify what parts of your question you missed. So next slide, please. Okay, as you approach becoming a Medicaid biller, you have to think about three different parts of the puzzle. The first part of the puzzle we've talked a little bit about is eligibility and enrollment, is the people I wanna work with, is the population I wanna work with, able to assist Medicaid eligible, are they enrolled? What happens? What do I need in order to get them enrolled? Do I need documentation? Do I need to bring them to the human services zones? What makes getting them enrolled hard? And how do I support that in that enrollment? You need to be tracking. We put up the eligibility tracker there. That also helps to say, so you know who's enrolled. Um, individuals can call the Medicaid office through the system and say, I'm trying to check and see if Marcella's enrolled and you can track that information. Once you're enrolled as a provider, you'll have access to a state database that tells you who's enrolled, what are their enrollment dates, why are they enrolled, et cetera. Monica, something to jump in here? You came up highlighted suddenly, so I wasn't sure if you had something to add. No, I, I wasn't going to say something, but I can actually. Um, the AVRS, the way you check if people have Medicaid coverage, um, it's this, they, they would um, call that number, the provider would call that number to find out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, I appreciate that. And then the second question is what benefits are they eligible for? What services are offered in the state's Medicaid plan? We saw the essential health benefits that are offered. What other benefits are offered? Um, if they have Samford, uh, I'm sorry, if they have Blue Cross Blue Shield, forgive me, that was last year. If they have Blue Cross Blue Shield, then you should be able to call Blue Cross Blue Shield and ask them those questions. If they have the state, then you're working with the human services zones to determine what services, think about what services they need, what disabilities, what challenges, what functional limitations they have, and then think about what services can help them address those needs. And then finally, you have to think about, is my provider enrolled? Is my agency enrolled? I can deliver a service to a person, Monica can deliver a service to me, but if Monica's agency isn't enrolled in Medicaid, then Monica's agency can't bill Medicaid. So the agency has to get enrolled. Literally our first session is Medicaid provider enrollment. You have to, for the 1915i services, you have to get your agency enrolled. The people who are delivering your services, you have to get them enrolled as providers as well. Is your agency, again, Medicaid speak in network, for the local managed care organization, what are you doing? Do you have a, a contract or how are you, how, what agreement have you worked out with Blue Cross Blue Shield um, for if you're serving people in the expansion population, you have to be enrolled as a Medicaid agency 
And then you have to, if you're dealing with managed care, then you have to have an agreement with the managed care entity for my agency can deliver these services. Here's how we're going, here's how they're going to pay me, et cetera. So three different pieces of the puzzle. Individuals have to be enrolled for the services that they need. Here's another magic phrase in Medicaid, medical necessity criteria. The person has to meet medical necessity for the service. And then finally, is my agency enrolled? Each of those people pieces of the puzzle have to be in place in order for your agency to successfully build Medicaid. Questions? Folks, put in the chat, if your agency is already enrolled in Medicaid, what services are you enrolled in Medicaid in your state to provide? Would love to hear that as well from, from folks. So put a couple of examples in the chat here. Yep, so Nikki's agency is enrolled to provide outpatient mental health. Tiffany's is enrolled to provide the 1915i services. That's great. Though Tiffany, I will also say you bring this up. This is a good point. You may not be enrolled for all of the, I believe there are 12 or 13 different 1915i services. You may be enrolled just for, say, care coordination and, you know, housing supports. You may be enrolled for other things. So Rhonda's agency is enrolled in billing for mental health and children. Becky, I knew this. You guys are Prairie Harvest is enrolled for TCM, 1915i care coordination and rehab. So this is all... Um, possibilities. Can you talk about tobacco cessation counseling coverage, about the billing, what standing orders are needed? I can't. Um, I don't know whether that's a separate service. I don't recall that as being part of the I service. Um, community options is enrolled in each service. Tiffany, thank you for that. You're right. Monica, um, I don't know who about tobacco cessation, and I don't know whether that's a Medicaid service or that's a grant service. I'm not sure if that's a Medicaid service or not. Um, I, it's certainly not part of the 1915I, um, but I I don't even know where I would find that out. I know our, our behavioral health division works with, um, no, I don't know that, the Department of Department of Health has a tobacco cessation program, but I don't know that that's Medicaid. Or yeah, it may be a grant program. Yeah, um, yeah. That makes sense. Got enrollment for residential treatment for substance use services. Community options is enrolled in every service. I didn't know you were community options. Thank you, Tiffany. Let's see what else. We've got a couple other folks here. TCM rehab, 1959i, housing support vaccine, health track screenings. Vaccines are usually not a, are often not a Medicaid service. They're often a public health funded service, health screenings, other nursing services. So they may, you may not be billing Medicaid, you're billing someone for it and thank you, please thank you for doing it, et cetera. But whether you're billing specifically Medicaid for that, it usually has to be a specific Medicaid related services. Peer support, Melinda's got a couple here. Lighthouse Church is enrolled for care coordination, peer support, non-medical transportation and housing support. That's great. So to the to the point here, uh, Melinda, you're just the, the next next one on my this screen. If you suddenly wanted to offer, you know, medical respite, you would have to go back and enroll in that service as well. Now, the first service you enroll in is always the hardest because you have to give the state all of the information, all the administrative department about your agency. Often to add a service, it's just one more thing to check, but know that you have to. Um, if you want to add another service, you can't just wake up one morning and deliver the services. You have to submit to the state um, state requirements for, for those services. So this is right. Yep. So we've got Allison's working with enrolled special education units who have SLP, OT, and if that's occupational therapy, PT, ABA, nursing, rehab services. Yep. And the question is, are they billing through the schools for that? Are they billing through Medicaid? These are some of the questions. Uh, OT, AT, ABA, rehab services. I don't know about nursing. All can be, could be billed in Medicaid as long as that's covered in your state's Medicaid plan. So yes, home care. And then we've got some folks who are not enrolled, hospital, outpatient, inpatient swing beds. Oh, I haven't heard that term in a long time, swing beds. Yep. All right. So 
again, just a really fundamental essential point. The person has to be enrolled. The state has to see them as enrolled or in the next nine, last 90 days enrolled. Benefits, the benefits have to be covered by your state plan, all of these things that are listed, um, hospital, outpatient, inpatient, um, home health care, all listed there. And then your agency has to be enrolled. The state has to know that I, agency A, I, PCMH, is enrolled for hospital, outpatient, and inpatient, and swing bed care. And you've negotiated a rate with the state in order to be paid for that. So you submit your bills to the state. You say, look, we've proven to you that Marcella is eligible for Medicaid, and we gave her hospital outpatient services on this date when she was enrolled in Medicaid, and we're enrolled to deliver those services because we're PCMH. Now you can pay us for those services. That's how the process works, but you have to have each of those pieces in place for that payment. Question. All right, next slide. So you are enrolling as a provider. You are enrolling as an agency. That's your individual provider. And we've got a link here to the 1915I provider enrollment process. And then we've got a link to the individual. So if I am running an agency, agency A is now enrolled, but I, Marcella, am also delivering direct services. Once I work for agency A, I have to submit paperwork to the state that says, hey, look, I work for agency A and I meet all the state's criteria for delivering direct 1915 I related services. Um, again, we're going to go in real detail on this. And thanks, Ambrosia, for that, for that link there on the process overview. And so we'll go through that, um, these processes step by step. Um, know that they are iterative processes. By that, I mean that you may take the process and enroll as an agency from January and February or March. It may take a little while. Only then can you start enrolling your direct services staff in that. You need that foundation there. Um, so think about those different processes and make sure you've got staff who are identified or taking all of your individual direct services staff, administrative staff usually, that are helping them through that process. Only when they are enrolled as an individual and your agency is enrolled are you going to be able to bill for that. So next slide, please. So here we talked about eligibility versus enrolled. Um, some services are for children, some services are not. You have to be enrolled in Medicaid, as we said. Enrollment in Medicaid is at or below 150% of the federal poverty level. You have to have a qualifying behavioral health diagnosis. We can share those with you. And you have to have a food ask for a World Health Organization disability assessment scale of 25 or higher. Uh, what I've heard from the housing support providers is 50 was too high a number on the who'd ask for, but 25 is really in good shape. Um, we will also, our second session on Medicaid eligibility will, I'm sorry, on the Medicaid Academy will cover participant enrollment eligibility. So we'll take you through a list of what all of those qualifying diagnoses are. Um, I think we already had a link to the state plan amendment and they're also all listed there. But they are the majority of um, serious and persistent mental illness, be behavioral health diagnoses, um, but a very comprehensive list of diagnoses are required. It's important to know that the 1915 I services are just for people with behavioral health diagnoses. I'm using behavioral health as an umbrella term to encompass both mental health and substance use services and people who have co-occurring disorders, et cetera. That's who's listed under behavioral health. If you think the person you're working with meets these requirements, then you can enroll them by completing the state form 741 and submitting that to the human services zones. Um, so there is Medicaid eligibility, and then there is Medicaid enrollment. And then once you are enrolled in Medicaid, then you are possibly eligible for the 1915I services, where the people you're working with are eligible for the I services. And they also have to go through a separate enrollment process to be part of the 1915I services. If you think folks meet other requirements there. Okay, next slide, please. These are separate processes that are worked on with the zones. So, how do you get to Medicaid eligibility determinations? Well, this is the link here for what Monica was talking about, the ABRS system for people. Providers can't use these sites until you're Medicaid enrolled providers. Um, there's a link to talk about who's eligible for Medicaid expansion. The individual though can use these systems to find out whether they're enrolled and share that information with you. 
you can help people apply for enrollment online at the website listed here. Um, as we said, persons who are 150, above 150% of the federal poverty level may be categorically eligible for Medicaid, but they won't be eligible for the I. I make $30,000 a year. Am I at 150% of the poverty level? I have six children. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. We've got DHS chart on the federal poverty level and incomes, I'm sorry, household size. So that will help you determine whether or not the people you're working with are Medicaid eligible or not. We've also got a link here to find your human services zones. For some of the zones, the for smaller zones, more rural zones, Medicaid eligibility worker, the 1915I eligibility worker are the same person. Maybe you can work on these things for simultaneously. For the larger zones, they may be different workers. You may be with one section here. They get the people enrolled. You support people to get their documentation and make those meetings, et cetera. And then they have to move over to the other eligibility worker there. So it's a, it's a different process with each of the zones. Um, and part of our dialogue, we hope, will be supporting you through that process. Um, I, you know, I should have said this at the start. CSH is going to be working with uh, supporting Monica and the team for the next year, starting with the Medicaid Academy, but we will have ongoing um, TA and individualized supports as well. And so we look forward both to supporting you through these processes and also learning from. Know that because Medicaid is such a huge, complicated program, I can hear Don Pearson from the state, uh, state DHS office saying, you know, look, the DD waiver services have been around for 30 years. They've evolved to the smooth sailing programs they are, but that took time. These programs are going to take time as well. Um, so I think it's really important to, you know, have that conversation, have that dialogue. Monica, I so appreciate how you're always available to answer all of these questions. Um, and that's a lot of what our supports will be as well, organizing the questions and, and getting them answered. Um, and finding also the state documentation. The state's done a lot of work building out that 1915i website to answer many of your questions. Um, we'll be sending you there to answer many of them because it really doesn't matter what we say, it matters what the state says um, and sending you to that. But then also if there are questions that haven't come up or the state hasn't thought about it become relevant in who you're serving, let's keep that dialogue going and, and build that as well. So we may have new answers, new policies, new eligibilities for you to think about too. So next slide, please. We've got to make sure people are Medicaid eligible and enrolled. Um, and then also know as a provider, you enroll, you enroll as a provider, you help the people enroll, you develop a person-centered plan development, you do service delivery, redetermination for services and coverage. Redetermination for healthcare coverage normally happens every year. But as we said, we're in a public health emergency right now. So the state hasn't been doing a formal redetermination process. They're probably beginning that and you wanna support your people through that. You also have to redetermine as a provider every five years. So that's important as well. Oh, and redetermination of eligibility for the 1915I services also is an annual process as well. That's what the uh, state has committed to the federal government. That's what they'll do. Um, so that, so you go into, once you signed up for the services, you're supporting people this, every year you're making a new case that says, Marcella is doing this much better than she was last year, but she still needs these supports and services in order to be in the most community integrated setting possible. That's some of the special things that they're looking for because the purpose to the eye is not just supporting people through their behavioral health needs, but making sure that they don't need to be institutionalized, making sure that they can live in the most community integrated setting possible. So that will come up down the road. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a slide we like to talk about, talking about administrative models for billing. Um, one of the things that's important of this is you may think about all this complexity and may think, I'm a little agency. There's like two to three of us. We're just trying to help people in our community. What can we do here? Can we, can we take all of this on our own? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. That's fine. You've got some different models that we've learned from the supportive housing world. Um, one is that the provider takes on all of the billing. I know this is SH provider supported housing, but this is true for any provider. Um, there's significant upfront cost to this. That's why the state's grants are so important. Um, this will be changes in your agency's information technology and your staffing and your policies and procedures. Through the Medicaid Academy, we'll be giving you a lot of templates and examples of this and a lot of support. But at the end of the day, you're making choices for your agency. Um, it does allow you to maintain accountability. The partnership model is often one where accountability is a little more diffuse and that's more challenging. So there are pluses and there's minuses for billing. You may partner with another agency who does service delivery. 
Um, or you may partner with another agency who does billing. There are billing clearinghouses out there. There are billing entities that um, do the paperwork for you, have the electronic health records, have those systems. That's obviously for a fee as well. So you think about that as well. And we've got a paper that really lists out all of these different models for billing um, and what the pluses are for some of them and what the minuses are for other ones of them. So it's really important that plan, um, your agency leadership thinks about what is our long-term plan in this space. This is not, I know my friends from Prairie Harvest can say this is not a short, quick transition. Um, this is often not a painless transition, but this is a possible transition. And this is one that will put your agency um, on track in order to deliver these services and be fiscally sustainable as an agency and grow to meet community needs for a long term, for the long term. Um, again, just want to shout out the folks at DHS. This is a process with constant dialogue. So it's really important to be in that dialogue and in that conversation, share what's working for you, share what's not understand where the barriers are. Some things may be things DHS could change, some things may not, some things may require federal intervention, and we've just got to be aware of those as well. So that dialogue with Monica and her folks is also going to be just really, really important. So next slide, please. CSH also has a services budget tool that we could share with you as well, that we've adapted that for North Dakota. That's on the 1915I state plan amendment website that um, Katie Joe shared earlier. Um, I may have somebody put that in the chat, I'll see if I can find that again, and just put it in the chat. Um, in, in Georgia or um, Eva, you can find that and put that in the chat, that would be helpful. Agencies need to understand what is what we call their total cost of care. What I mean by total cost of care is really what does it cost for you to do business? And when you understand that, when you understand not just what you have to pay your staff, but what you have to pay your supervisors, what you have to pay for billing, what you have to pay for administration, all of those pieces, then you can build a fiscally sustainable program. The 1915i services can cover many components of that. They're probably not going to cover all of it. So you have to think about what covers those other pieces as well. Um, I know agencies are small. They're operating on limited margins. There's just not a lot of money for everything out there. So I think it's going to be really important that you begin to think about, um, as you look about your business planning, you estimate your total cost of care. Um, we'll have a session where we talk about revenue generation, how much if you're delivering eye services, how much revenue do you generate, do you project to generate, and then how to um, do that implosion. That's, you know, unfortunately, that's the wrong, that's the Ignite Lake. Thank you for trying. Um, let's see if I can find this again. So I was in the chat, it's from Katie Joe, and it has our Just a second here, folks. Staffing and budgeting, that's the link. There we go. Okay. I got it. Put it in. The services budget tool is really going to help your agency de determine your total cost of care. Feel free to download that um, and adopt it for your agency. It's a spreadsheet. Do whatever you want with it. Make it work for your agency. But we'll be taking you through it um, when we get to session four of the Medicaid Academy as well. That's also going to be really important for your business planning efforts for revenue generation, et cetera. The next slide, please. Billing partnerships. Okay, you've decided you want to deliver the services. You've decided you don't want to take on the billing. You've decided you want to go to that third administrative model of billing. Who do I talk to? Who's already billing and who already has the infrastructure to bill? Um, you could talk to your community health centers and say whether they're willing to support you in that billing process for a fee, of course. Um, they may be serving um, 
site there. Uh, behavioral health clinics um, is they partners. If you're not a behavioral health clinic, you may already have billing infrastructure. Can you support some of these other community agencies and have them bill through you? Um, hospitals or third party billing entities. These are all agencies, companies in your community that have all of these um, what was I going to say that have all of these um, have the infrastructure already in and is there a way to partner with them so think about who some of your partners are in the community who's got that billing infrastructure who's the expert there maybe you want to use their infrastructure maybe you just want to ask them what's their electronic hack record what's their tracking system what works for them um, Lisa's getting a can't be reached error site for the Google Drive um, Lisa, give us your email and if, if Eva or Ambrosia, one of you can get that and we'll make sure that you get that and we'll we'll try to fix what's what's wrong there. I'm not sure about why you would get yeah, email Ambrosia and we'll get you those materials. Um, and anybody else wants that as, as as well, use Ambrosia's email for that if that's okay. I don't know why that would be coming. The Google Drive is supposed to be open. But if Katie Joe's still on and knows why somebody would get a can't be reached error, because I'm looking at it and it's Looks good to me, but I may have special privileges here that I want to make sure I can share. So yeah, sorry. Links working for Lisa. Okay, good. Awesome. All right. Katie Joe's gonna double check. Thank you, Katie Joe. I appreciate it. I don't know why it's working for some people. Maybe it's a security settings that each of us have on our emails. And Melinda, email Ambrosia, and she'll she'll get you those materials as well. All right. So billing partnerships, who in your, in your community is already billing Medicaid, who already understands Medicaid expansion, traditional Medicaid, who already is a contract with Blue Cross, how do you work with them, et cetera, um, and how do you kind of build off of their infrastructure and build a partnership there? Thanks, Katie Jo. All right. So next slide, please. All right. So we are here for questions. So does, Chris is asking a good question. Does eligibility criteria exist which speaks to agency board governance requirements? Agency board governance requirements will come in in the Medicaid provider enrollment process when you enroll as a provider. Specifically, the state will ask you for all your board member names, their affiliations, their social security numbers. They will want to be sure that anybody who is on your board is not on a federal list, OIG, what's it stand for? Office of the Inspector General that says that they cannot be involved in a Medicaid program because they have been convicted of Medicaid fraud or abuse. Give me two seconds and I will look up that, how to search the OIG website. The exclusions database as part of the Office of the Inspector General. Okay, I'm just pulling up that. Agencies that become Medicaid agencies are required annually to check and make sure that all of their staff and all of their board members are not on the, once a year, are not on the exclusions list. So, so this is federal. Federal Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General Exclusion. You will also need a, and we didn't talk about this here, we're going to talk about it. Um, and the provider enrollment, your agency should also be working on, if you want to do these services, you should also be working on getting a, I thought I had a slide on this, national provider identifier number. And you're going to need to commit to that process, exclusions database process to maintain your national PI as well. And the information for getting your NPI is usually pretty basic. You need a W-9 for your agency, you need your tax ID, um, you need basic administrative pieces there. If you don't have an NPI and you're thinking about doing anything in the Medicaid space, I suggest that's the first thing you do. The 
let's get this in place. What are the questions? Do we have more slides? Didn't I have an NPI slide? I thought I added one. Ambrosia, any more slides after this? Or is this the end? All right, so I think this is this is the end. What I will say is that, um, what was I gonna say? Um, Okay, so we will be starting the Medicaid Academy on um, August 3rd, I believe. Um, I believe that Eva Lerner from our team has sent out provider readiness assessments to or through Monica, maybe Monica, because it's your network, you've, you've sent that out to everybody. Take a look at that. Take a look at any other questions you have. Please feel free to be in touch with us or with Monica um, leading up to that. We will also definitely um, be giving you, um, you know, all of these materials will be on the website, um, et cetera, the recordings, the trainings, the tools. Um, we'll make sure they're not on inaccessible Google Drives um, and definitely work through the file sharing pieces there. Monica, what, what else? I wanna hand it over to you to see what else, what other, with this wonderful group you've got here. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention that not everyone who's attending today has committed to the um, to the Medicaid Academy, but I have even since we started had a couple of folks email me. So that's fantastic. If you are interested in participating in that, um, it is specifically for agencies who are committed to enrolling for 1959 I services. Um, so if you if that's where you are as an agency, please reach out to me if you would like to participate. Um, we have sent out those surveys, those readiness surveys to our first group um, of 11 providers. And I um, will be sending those readiness surveys out to the rest of the folks who have expressed um, commitment very soon. So if you haven't, if you've told me you want to participate but haven't received that survey yet, that's why, um, because I've just just hit that first group so far. Um, but yes, definitely, please let us know. We, you know, this is going to be a really valuable thing that we can bring to the state, and I feel like it's really going to be a game changer as far as bringing these services to those rural folks and those underserved folks. So, um, yeah, we'd love to have you participate. Um, and also, somebody is also asking, one of the slides had a, Eva, I don't know if you've got the slide deck, if you can grab the AVRS. Uh, login. It's on one of the the link for the AVRS system. Stephanie was asking for this. So if you can, it's one of the backslides. Medicaid eligibility, I think. Yes. Okay. So I see that there's some the the readiness assessment tool. Um, you can send that to Ambrosia, and yeah, if you want to send it to me as well, that's great. Um, I know. It, Eva's going to be out for a while on, on leave. Um, so she asked to get those sent to Ambrosia. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, I'm just looking. There was another question here for me. Um, yes, um, Tanya did sign up for the Medicaid Academy. Yep. From, from Native. And uh, Megan, you can, if you want to send me an email, it's, um, I'll drop my email in the chat here um, and let me know that you're interested in participating in that training. That would be awesome. Go. Here we go. Chat and try to make sure we answer this question. Oh, yep. Okay, Ambrosia, thanks for the AVRS info. Thank you. Um, thank you. Recording. Where will the recordings be available? Monica, do you know? I do. I don't yet have a spot okay. for them on our website, but I'll be creating on our trainings page. We have um, a link to join our um weekly ta calls and then we have our recorded trainings underneath that um i can send a link to that page where it
that'll be awesome. People definitely should have, and we literally will you know, be spending a lot of time on those pages. If you're starting that project, there is a ton of information there. Yeah, so this, this training page, you know, there's all sorts of good stuff on there, um, you know, even just to kind of get ready and poke around and see. Um, and you're all, of course, welcome to join our, our weekly TA calls as well um, for info or just to ask questions. So. I also just got a great message from, I don't know if there's a possibility to get her off, to get her off mute, Paula Burkhardt, who's from the North Dakota Navigator Project. This is a federally funded grant program. They help people apply for health insurance, the marketplace, but they also apply for Medicaid. There's six navigators across the state. The services are free and they're unbiased. That means they're not paid for by an insurance company. So they're not trying to you know, wean you towards one insurance company. They're really trying to look at what's the best coverage for you. Um, these are going to be really important people to know when we get to the end of the PHE because they're going to understand many of the nuances of getting people signed up for coverage here. Um, Paula, is it possible to get you off? mute or put any more information you send a direct message to me which is great but i really want this whole group to know about your team and your and your resources sure uh, we were selected for the state of north dakota by cms to offer these services for um, all of north dakota so if anyone is um, interested in more information i could put the 1-800 number in there we have six navigators and we have a great travel budget so we could come to your clinic to um, public health office wherever and we actually sit down with individuals face to face or virtually help them apply using either the healthcare.gov for a marketplace if they are um, no longer eligible for Medicaid or we can actually just help sit guide them through the whole process of um, applying for Medicaid. Thank you, thank you. So important. Just looking at, so Monica, you answered about the 1959 training, so it's Ambrosia for the readiness assessments. Ambrosia gave us the AVR fact sheet, so how to use that system. Thank you, thank you. I think we are up on the chat. So if you have asked a question and we haven't answered it, please ask again, because I'm missing it. Sorry. Oh, Navigator Project. Oh, Paula, that came just to me again. Let's see. If you click next to in the chat, let me see if I can cut and paste it. There we go. OK. Ah, there we go. You got it. You got it. Both got it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please share that information. Even if you are, you decide, you know what, I'm not going to offer these services. I'm not doing whatever. Please make sure the people you work with have health insurance coverage. Um, and please use Paula and her team and all other resources you can to make sure people have coverage, have continuous coverage. People need healthcare coverage. They need it in, in a pandemic, even at the end stages, hopefully, of a pandemic, but um, they need it every day. Please make sure that healthcare coverage is maintained. Other questions? Monica, any? They're located at Minot State University. Awesome. And Monica, any anything else you wanted us to cover today? I don't think so. I think that's probably a lot of information for people to kind of sit on and digest. So yeah, um, agreed. yeah agreed. just just know that we'll get this um, this training posted as soon as possible so that you can go back and you know, if you remember something you're quite clear on, go back and rewatch that section and, um, and certainly reach out with any questions as well. And if I can answer them, I will ask our, our uh, subject matter experts here and we'll get you an answer. We're a good team. We're trying, to, we're trying to be a staff extender for you. You can only answer so many. All right, we're going to stay on. That's today's training. Um, I'll stay on for a couple of minutes in case anybody else has questions. Monica, please stay with me. Um, but, um, you know, because I know there are going to be questions that I might, I might not be able to get, but you might. So, but other than that, um, we will see you all in the coming weeks and months. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.
talks to people. Monica, I see, you know, the numbers are going down, so people are signing yeah. off. Yeah. Anything else you want to? It's exciting to hear about the navigators. That's so helpful. Yeah, that is. We, we do have a lot of good things going on. It's just getting the message out as far as, you know, everything that we have. That's why I was so excited. Yeah, that's why I was excited for this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm really happy with the response that we had to this training today. That was a, a lot of people. On. Great. Yeah. yeah. A lot of good engaged questions. Yes, yes, definitely. I don't know if these remaining folks have anything. They might just not have had a chance to log off yet. Yeah. Okay, well, we can, if we think that everybody's just logging off, we can end and um, yeah. we will be in touch. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Monica, for your help. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.